Witam Państwa, nazywam się Marcin Piasecki, jest ze mną gość, pan profesor Nils Wilking, onkolog. A będziemy rozmawiać o bardzo poważnym problemie, jakim jest rak płuc. Good afternoon, Mr. Professor. Good afternoon. Very nice to speak to let's, you. Let's talk about lung cancer. Uh, and uh, why has lung cancer been the biggest killer among oncological diseases for so many years? Uh, I mean, the main reason being smoking. Uh, that's uh, the, the, the major contributor to lung cancer, so smoking. And of course, there is uh, part of, of, of the lung cancer burden is explained by pollution, etc. But by far, uh, smoking is a major contributor to uh, high rates of lung cancer. And lung cancer has also been very hard to treat, very difficult to treat. Uh, most patients come to the diagnosis with advanced, uncurable disease. So uh, they are not candidates for, let's say, surgery. And that, that's why it's, uh, it's a very, it's a very uh, uh, large burden, a uh, large part of the cancer burden in many populations. And uh, multiple uh, medical and systemic experts predict that we are on the beginning of revolution if, uh, in the treatment of lung cancer. Do you think it is true? What should be consid considered as this breakthrough step or action? Well, there has been several breakthroughs. First of all, I think uh, we've seen uh, quite uh, over over the years we've seen a reduction in the rate of daily smokers and we can say I'm coming from Sweden where we have I believe the lowest uh, rate of daily smokers in Europe and and that has contributed a lot to decrease of lung cancer so there has been progress in in in, in prevention uh, we are seeing some promising data on early detection pre uh, screening for lung cancer uh, lung cancer surgery has up till now been the only way to cure lung cancer and it still remains that but of course if we can detect cancer early we can operate patients and they can be cured but with uh, the major breakthrough uh, has come also in the medical treatment until the 90s uh, basically we had very little benefit from chemotherapy and other interventions but chemotherapy has developed and now we have what we call targeted therapies therapies that go for a certain mutation in lung cancer and together with immunotherapy that basically uh, boosts the, bo uh, the body's own reaction to cancer we see that from uh, having five-year survival rates in populations below 10 percent we can now see that some patients uh, or 50, 60 percent of patients with metastatic lung cancer at diagnosis actually live beyond five years. So that's been a major shift and that has come over the last 10 years. And what are exactly the advantages of immunotherapy and immunochemiotherapy compared to chemotherapy? in treatment of lung cancer? Well, first of all, it seems that uh, uh, immunotherapy uh, in combination, but also as the single treatment is much more effective than traditional chemotherapy. And then we see that at least if you give immunotherapy alone, the side effects are often much less prominent, much less disturbing with basically no uh, vomiting uh, and so on. But of course, immunotherapy has got some side effects of their own, which can be difficult and you have to be, uh, have to have a good uh, education to be able to treat that because immunotherapy can give some uh, side effects that uh, healthcare system is not really used to. But, but overall, side effects are less and efficacy uh, effectiveness is higher with, with uh, uh, some of these uh, new immunotherapy and targeted therapies. 
Uh, four years ago, you prepared a report entitled Access to High-Quality Oncology Care Access Across Europe. How does access to innovative, innovative therapy, therapeutic solutions for lung cancer look like in Europe? Where are the European standards in this field? Uh, yeah, first of all, we'll actually done an update. So there is a report that came out in January this year, which basically updates the uh, 2016 report. Uh, we can see if we look at five year survival as a comparator for lung cancer from diagnosis, we can see that in almost all countries there has been a, a, an improvement, but there are still quite large differences from some of the countries in, in, in uh, Southeast Europe, like Bulgaria, the five year survival rate is 5%, while if you go to Austria, uh, Switzerland, it's 20%. So there are huge differences in survival rates. If we look at Poland, Poland has a five year survival rate of around 10% at present, but it has improved, it has improved. So. Uh, and I think we're seeing improvements in, in, in many countries, but still there are large differences between especially Central Eastern Europe and some more affluent countries in, uh, in, in Western Europe and countries like Switzerland, Austria. Mr. Professor, what are the biggest differences between European, European countries uh, when um, it comes to the access to innovative uh, treatment for patients with lung cancer? I think uh, when it comes to access to the new drugs, it's basically it's very closely related to uh, the economic uh, uh, situation in the country. So countries with a low uh, GDP per capita, uh, they will have we see it, they have a much lower access to the new uh, and mostly very expensive drugs. So we can see a clear correlation between low spending or low ability to spend healthcare budget, allocate healthcare budget to lung cancer treatment and the outcome. So I think that, that we are now seeing a gap in Europe that is largely related to the economical situation. But also, of course, we, we have differences in, in rate of smokers and we've had differences in success in preventing uh, smoking. Or, I mean, it's, we see differences in between countries in Western Europe and Central Europe when it comes to the ability to, to prevent young people from starting smoking and also to get people off uh, cigarette smoking. And uh, what can Poland learn from, for example, Sweden when, in, uh, when in ca it comes to lung cancer treatment and vice versa? Well, I think uh, Poland has really been, uh, I mean, a lot of the clinical uh, studies uh, with new compounds and so on, there has been, uh, Poland has been a major contributor. So Poland has really played a major role in, in developing uh, many of these new therapies. Uh, I guess we in Sweden have more money to allocate for cancer treatment. Uh, but uh, and I think also we have uh, a better registration of cancer cases and cancer outcome. Still, I believe we have a lot of problems in a country like Sweden. We have a, a regionalized healthcare, so a patient may receive different treatment if they live in one healthcare region in Sweden versus another healthcare region. Um, so I'm not sure. I, th I think, first of all, I think Polish oncologists are very well trained and I've been very impressed going around in Europe because I think the education level of, of uh, Polish cancer uh, workforce is high uh, and it's very much at the level uh, like in Sweden and so on. So I, th I think it's more, you know, that lung cancer is a more dominant uh, uh, part of the cancer population in Poland. So there's a lot more patients with lung cancer compared to the Swedish environment. So I think the high rate of lung cancer, which is now declining in, in Poland, but it's, it's, been, it's been one of, 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 of parts of the problem. Still, I, I do want to emphasize that 
Polish uh, oncologists have been very, very uh, instrumental in many of the studies developing new cancer therapies for lung cancer. And what are the biggest challenges in oncology for next 10 or 20 years? And what are the biggest successes for last 10 years? Uh, if I start with the last question, I think the biggest success for the last 10 years has been uh, immunotherapy. We see a tremendous change in the outcome of melanoma of skin cancer patients. We're seeing a very large improvement in, in, uh, in lung cancer and other cancer forms. And there are also other what we call targeted drugs that have also played a very important role in lung cancer and in other cancers. So that has been the, the change over the last 10 years. Then the next 10, 20 years, I think will be very challenging. We'll see an enormous development in, in the understanding of cancer. And we we'll see a number of cancer drugs being developed. They come, however, at a very high cost. So we need to be able to translate the, the scientific steps we are making into patient access. So there needs to be new payment models because uh, countries like Poland and a number of countries, including Sweden, will not be able you know, to, to pay the full price of what let's say the industry asks for drugs. So there, there needs to be a, a new payment model because if you develop a good medicine, it should go to patients, not stay in the pharmacy uh, 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 and, and not being used in patients. I think there is a challenge from the economical side. And there is also, of course, challenges when it comes to, for lung cancer, it's preventing lung cancer, seeing that people don't get lung cancer and they, they don't, uh, start smoking. I think those are, so over the next 20 years, I think we have an immediate challenge with the COVID-19 because I mean, that consumes such a large part of healthcare, which means we, we will have, a, we will be challenged really to look into how do we make best use of the limited healthcare budgets we have from now on, uh, not only uh, linked to, to cancer, but all the healthcare uh, sectors. And of course we need to, increase knowledge, we need to increase also the understanding how we spend resources and money in the best way. And uh, how uh, the pandemic, COVID pandemic, um, will change the oncology in the future, the priorities of oncology for upcoming, upcoming years, as well as situation of patients with lung cancer. I think the immediate thing, what we've seen, uh, as we've seen it in Sweden, and I guess it's also present in, in Poland, that uh, there's been a delay. Uh, patients uh, are reluctant to seek medical attention, even though they have symptoms. So I think that may, in at least in the short term, over the next year or two, mean that we will have see patients that have more advanced disease uh, and, and there is, we will have uh, patients that have avoided, you know, seeking medical attention due to the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, the second thing is that, of course, uh, patients treated under treatment for lung cancer, uh, and even though they've been treated with immunotherapy and so on, they are a, a risk group for, for of course, uh, if they get COVID-19, especially if you have lung cancer, already a, 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 a very severe lung disease, and, you know, COVID-19 is also mainly a, 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 a disease of the lungs. So, of course, these uh, patients with lung cancer under treatment are, of course, uh, in a critical risk group. So there are immediate threats and there are also more, more uh, prominent uh, threats in the future. And I think uh, uh, the treatment, uh, the, the lung cancer patient is at risk for COVID-19, but there is also the risk of delaying diagnosis. And then we have the, the, the impact on the healthcare system that has been so put under so much uh, pressure over over the last uh, uh, four or five months. So it it will it will be a very uh, big challenge, you know, to 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 come back to to normal situation. Thank you, thank you very much for interview. Thank you, thank you very much. And finally, it worked with the tech technology. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Moim gościem był pan profesor Nils Winking, 
Onkolog. 